各位观众，接下来呢，我们就要进行我们今天第二场的论坛。那么这一场论坛的主题就是 Designing Compliance, Sanctions, Anti-Monetary Laundering, and Custody. The topic for our second panel discussion is Designing Compliance, Sanctions, Anti-Money anti Laundering, and Custody. Now, if I read your name, can you please also proceed on to the stage? First of all, let us welcome our moderator for this panel discussion, Philip Gradwell, Chin Analysis Chief Economist. Welcome. Let us also welcome Samuel M. Kim and Chang Senior Foreign Attorney. Welcome. Now let us welcome Nathan Kaser, Cardano Foundation Chairperson. Good morning. Mark Schwab, Keenan Wood, Malison Senior Partner. Good morning. Again, let us welcome Joshua Ashley Clayman, Clayman Founder and CEO. Good morning. Last but not least, let us welcome Benjamin Sue, Ledger Managing Director, Head of Asia Pacific. And again, for this topic, it is designing compliance, sanctions, anti-monetary laundering, and custody. I'm going to pass it on to Philip, our moderator for this panel discussion. 那么我们现在这第二场的论坛呢，就正式开始。Well, welcome to our panel on designing compliance. This morning, we've had the vision of the regulators, we've had the passion of Rubini,、um, but now we're going to hear about the reality of compliance. From a great set of practitioners. To give a little introduction to myself, I'm Philip Gradwell, the chief economist at Chainalysis. We're the leading compliance platform for the world's crypto exchanges and businesses. And then I'm going to hand over to my panel just to give a short introduction to each themselves. Sure.、Uh, my name is Samuel Yim.、Uh, I'm an attorney at、uh, Kim and Chang,、uh, part of the、uh, Kim and Chang's blockchain fintech team. Uh, we are the largest law firm in Korea. We have about 800 lawyers. And、uh, prior to joining Kim and Chang, I worked in a global law firm in、uh, New York, Hong Kong, Singapore. And prior to being a lawyer, I used to be a U.S. Army officer and、uh, retired as a captain. Hi, everybody. My name is Nathan Kaiser. I,、uh, like others here, I used to be a partner at a law firm, and I went to the darker side faster than you guys did,、uh, but. Happy to join me, and、uh, so I was in Taiwan for 20 years. Right now, I'm in Boston in,、uh, at Harvard University. I'm the general counsel to Input Output Hong Kong,、uh, IOHK, and I'm the、uh, chairperson of the Cardano Foundation. And it's great to be back in Taipei.、Yeah. I'm Mark Shab. I'm a partner with King and Wood, so I'm still on the lighter side, not the darker side.、Uh, and my practice is mostly trying to help companies not go to jail in China. And if they do go to jail in China, we try to help them out. <laughs> I'm Josh Clayman. I'm just thankful to be on the stage again, so I won't reintroduce myself. Thank you. Hi, I'm、uh, Benjamin Sung from Ledger.、Uh, so I head up、uh, Ledger's、uh, business out here in Asia Pacific. For those who don't know Ledger, we're a technology security company focused around blockchain. And、uh, at the moment, we're basically looking to solve problems for、uh, three types of clients.、Uh, one is on the retail side, where most of you may know、uh, the Ledger Nano, Nano S, Nano X. We also have an institutional solution where we've added governance layers to the security side to help、uh, hedge funds,、uh, crypto exchanges, brokers, and banks to to secure crypto assets. And then, last but not least, we also help secure endpoints between machines and objects. So,、uh, part of our IoT division. Thanks. Great. Just to tell people, we also have a Slido、uh, questionnaire. So for those who want to answer that, do log on and give your opinion, and maybe we'll get that up at the end of the debate. But I wanted to start off this discussion really by taking on Nareel's point that apparently there's massive criminality in crypto. It sounds like there's a need for compliance. Where do you think compliance is needed most in crypto, or do you think that Nareel's got it all wrong? And actually, it's all fine. I mean, Sam, maybe do you mind taking that off? Sure.、Um, you know, I do appreciate the the spirit of crypto、uh, and the freedom it provides. But with any sort of freedom, there's some level of responsibility. And I think 
unless we're living in a line, you know, you know, maybe compliance won't matter, but we do live in a community where we share and we are integrated in society. Uh, so I do get a sense that we do need some sort of a compliance over crypto, and I think having some sort of compliance, some sort of a mainstream, you know, acceptance of uh, of the cryptocurrency in uh, the society itself. And so, uh, but this is, uh, you know, when you regulate anything, the first draft of any regulation is not always perfect. And so I do expect further revisions of this draft. And, you know, we're going to have to somehow find a right balance for each and every jurisdiction. So, you know, we do see as one part of uh, becoming more mainstream fabric of any society. And also, I think, you know, we'll need some tweaks as we go along, and we're going to get it right eventually. Anyone else got a view on whether compliance is really needed to take crypto mainstream? Or actually, do you think compliance gets in the way of the innovation? So I think it, I, I think it can get in the way of innovation, but I think it's there. It's like when you go into a basement, and you might not see a cobweb, right? And you walk right into it, right? It's, all, it's there. The regulations were there. Your compliance obligations were there. And I think that's one of the things when, you know, in the past few years, particularly, you know, with the ICO boom, um, a lot of folks, well-meaning folks in many cases, they didn't realize that they hadn't created something that was somehow outside of the law. But the laws do apply. So I think it's it's almost a false question about whether, whether we should have them because we do have them. I do think one of the great things, though, about crypto and blockchain in general is that the programmability is there. You can program in compliance. And so you, don't, you can take out some of the guesswork and the human error if you actually take the time, and you have the right programmers, to try and program in compliance. So I think look, my, my personal feeling is that um, the ICOs, like the previous speaker talked about, can you really scam people who are trying to scam each other? So I think really everybody knew that most of those ICOs were total scams. I mean, I think it was people, it was a big Ponzi scheme and they were all trying to get in earlier than the others. Uh, and that should be regulated because it was lots of money. I think the thing is, your question was about compliance. I think regulation is necessary once it goes mainstream. But if you have too much regulation early on, you do strangle things. And I'd also like to address one thing is, we always talk about the government and the regulators, like they're always the good guys. Uh, I think in the, uh, it was mentioned today that in the FATFA new regulations, they want to track every transaction over a thousand US dollars. Why is that? I mean, I think we should also expect from the regulators, they don't just retrofit old laws, but they should also give transparency about how do they come up with these regulations? What purpose are these regulations? Because my personal fear as a citizen in the society is that they will start tracking everything I do and I lose all semblance of privacy and I don't think that's really the whole concept of what crypto was about. I, I, think, I think compliance is absolutely necessary. If you think about what comes before compliance, it's governance. And so when you don't have governance, that's when you kind of need, need compliance. And when I look at this space, I come from the traditional finance space before moving over to, to the dark side. And um, if I look at a traditional hedge fund today, you have a, you, you, you'll have a traditional third-party custodian. Um, in, in the whole crypto space, you have self-custody. And self-custody, I never really understood what that really meant. But today, it's like if, if someone transferred me $100 million and I'm a hedge fund manager and, you know, the Bahamas looks pretty nice, I could just kind of transfer, transfer the funds away. So um, I agree with Mark's comment is that I think regulation is needed, but it just can't be... Um, overly stringent that it actually kind of hinders innovation. And I think so far what we've seen with uh, regulation today is that, um, you know, in certain markets you might see uh, certain regulation or guidelines or sandbox uh, kind of guidelines that suggest a certain amount of insurance, which may cripple businesses from being able to further and, and continue to grow. <clears throat> Maybe two points. One is that what often gets forgotten is that when we talk about compliance and anti-money laundering and, and regulations and governance, is that there's a why, a why we have, like the laws that we actually have. We have them for a reason, and, and everybody knows that when you have a traffic accident, that you hope that there's gonna be somebody on the road built by somebody who's gonna pick you up and put you in a hospital, and somebody's gonna pay for it. So there's this protection from investor protection to scam protection and so on, and it all kind of is there, not just for the bankers or, or for, for la Bula, but because it's needed. So I think that's one point, uh, which in the crypto space often does not get discussed. We have laws because we needed them 
and because we have to protect goods that need protection both in fiat and in crypto. The second thing, just, just to where we are between uh, not regulating crypto and over-regulating crypto, when you listen to our previous speaker, uh, where there's nothing, you know, they were asleep at the wheel, the regulators, and then the crypto people say, like, we're strangled. Well, maybe we're in the middle, no? Maybe it's good, no? And, and you can look at Taiwan, you can look at the U.S. A lot of people were at, sleeping at the wheel, and then they kind of woke up. Maybe we're in, we're in a good middle, yeah. I want to pick up on part of the discussion here, really about that transparency and privacy. You know, the fact that the Financial Action Task Force is going to recommend that there's more transaction monitoring. I mean, this is fairly standard in the fiat world. Why should crypto be different? I don't want the government to know what I was doing at 1.30 last night in the morning. No, uh, I think, look, I'm also against the fact that the government can track all of my currency. I, I don't like the fact that they are able to track every single transfer. And I think that goes to a fundamental question about what society you want to live in. And so I think that's a false choice. And I think with the new technologies, we're also looking at AI and all these other ways that they can manipulate big data. Is it going to be that if everything goes digital, that they can really track everything you've done? And that's something which I personally don't want to give up. So it's not the question of why it should be different. Maybe we should be assessing why they collect all this information also on fiat currency. I think there's an interesting point that you raise, like a broader point as well, is why are we so eager to have ourselves tracked? Like when, you know, I'm very pro blockchain, right, that obviously, but when I think about things like tracking, for example, pork across Asia, or, you know, other types of supply chain tracking, just to take it away from digital assets in, in the typical way that we're talking, uh, but if you think about that, and you think about, say, tracking apples, okay, great, so if there's a recall, Right? You'll be able to find out you know, that the apple was bad. And maybe you have an Alexa fridge, and maybe it has a sticker on the apple, an IoT sticker. And maybe that apple, you go to take it out, and the fridge says, don't eat that, it's been recalled. Right? This can be a beautiful vision until you realize you could be that apple. Right? <laughs> when you go somewhere, you could be that apple that is tracked. And certainly in the US, we have Easy Pass. I don't know if you have the equivalent here. But I know even in certain places, just trying to use fiat currency places is difficult, you know? I, I think just kind of, I, I'm personally very much against kind of tracking of personal information. Um, I, but I see it as kind of a, a two edged sword. Uh, one side of it is by you tracking all this data with all the big data, you're able to, there's a lot of predictive analytics. If I have a car today, you can tell me that, oh, your car is about to break down. You should go take it for a service maintenance record. But um, the problem that I see with kind of sharing and disclosing personal information, I think we've all experienced this, is the amount of kind of solicitation that we all experience, like people calling you about, you know, bank accounts. So if, if this information starts getting passed around and circulated, I guarantee you, whether it's an exchange, whether it's a fund, um, somebody's going to sell that list and that information's going to get into someone's hands and, and the use of that content is going to be more for commercial use as for actual the, the greater good. I think part of that, I, I completely agree with the panelists. I think part of that, you know, with these whole regulatory changes and invasion of privacy, I think part of it is it's, it's on us to be participants of the government, express your views to your legislators, and try to, you know, protect our privacy to the extent possible. I, I, I can't imagine all of it going away, but, you know, the, the responsibility does belong to us to uh, engage with the regulators and your lawmakers to make these changes so that it's not over intrusive. And I think that's really the next step that we have to do. I think, I mean, not to hark on about it, but I think the whole problem is that you, uh, the citizens cannot really talk to the legislatures. I think, you know, that's the big problem is special interest groups and how they're able to influence the government, I think, is the major problem. And I think also what you were saying about heart, you know, if you have a heart problem, sorry about your heart problem, but if you, you know, I, I'm not against sharing my information, especially if it's anonymized and then it's delivered to me in a certain way. But I'm more worried about the government collecting the information or Facebook collecting that information without my permission. And I think, you know, this legislature that we're always saying, oh, the regulator will do something, the GDPR stuff in Europe, the only change is if you're in Europe, every time you go on a website, they say to you, do you accept? And everybody presses yes. So I think we have to rethink it and actually change regulation. I think Jason mentioned it earlier today. We have to rethink legislation. We just can't continue to do the same stuff because it's a very different technology. 
So we're actually talking about a, a lot of different things now, and I think the first question to ask is, as Mark said, is what kind of society do you want to live in? And then uh, we will quickly see that we actually all want to live in a society where some data is tracked. We actually want that. And I can tell you that from my personal experience, we have a lot of requests from crypto holders who get, whose funds get stolen because they lost a key or they were scammed or so. And what do you do if your funds get stolen? You go to the police. And I, I'm telling you, everybody in this room, if your funds get stolen, that's exactly where you're gonna go, to the police. And then what are you gonna do? You're gonna say like, you need to track down where my funds went. <laughs> police is like, yeah, but it's crypto. Yeah, but it's my money. So, you know, you need to now do it. And so I think there is still an understanding that we do wanna track some data and where stuff goes. But the question is how exactly and to what extent is one question. And then technically, can we do a better job so stuff doesn't get out of hand? So we're talking about a lot of different uh, levels here, and that makes the discussion sometimes a bit complex. But hey, well, it's a great clarification, <laughs> laying it out. I mean, absolutely, compliance, I think, is the issue that a lot of the people in this industry you know, try and grasp around. And from my perspective, compliance is actually starting to generate you know, perhaps different approaches in crypto. So. For example, maybe stable coins are easier from a compliance and regulatory perspective, and so that's where people are innovating. Or we see security token offerings as the next version of ICOs. You know, what trends do you think will occur in cryptocurrency innovation because of the sort of path of least resistance that compliance currently offers? Will we see more innovation in stable coins, more innovation in, in SDOs, or something completely different? Yeah, like uh, personally, I, my perspective of STOs is I, I think it's been kind of marketed as the next, you know, greatest thing. But um, at the end, when, when you think about STO, there's going to be a lot of regulations around it. Like in the U.S., you have like Reg A, Reg D filings. If it's a Reg D filing, you have to be accredited investor. So you, you essentially, you're going to have to have like a whitelisted group of investors. And so before we think that this is going to become this coin that's going or token that's going to be traded universally across hundreds of exchanges, um, it's gonna, the liquidity is going to be pretty crap, quite honestly. And it's going to be really just, uh, it's another way of really wrapping an OTC um, at the end of the day. So um, when, I, when I look at some of the, some of the, some of the applications, I, I do see kind of challenges. Um, my view is I think longer term, we're not going to see kind of thousands of different types of tokens. You're probably going to have a few. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, compared to the earlier speaker, I do think there is a use case of Bitcoin as a, as a uh, intermediary of exchange, almost as digital gold. So at the end of the day, you still, you still need something that is relatively more recognized in the market to go back to, to fiat. So I, I don't think fiat's going to go away. I think fiat is here to stay. But at the same time, I think if there are blockchain applications, you will need something like Bitcoin at the end to act as that intermediary of exchange. Right. I mean, I, I also think the biggest problem here, and people have said that, and we'll say that at every single panel, is is still adoption. No? And, 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 and he was right. No, nobody uses Bitcoin. Nobody uses this. Nobody uses that. And it's a bit true. So what we need is network effect and adoption. And we're going to get that with stable coins, whether it's on a fiat currency or something like Libra. And then we can get moving. No? And I think that's where, if there is a pain point to address, it's, it's the old pain point of payment, of value transfer. And STOs, I don't think we need to address that you and you and you can invest into $2 of whatever company here and there. That's not a, pay, a pain point. So you're not going to jump on this. And the regulations are much more difficult. So first we need to address that Alice can pay something to Bob no matter where Alice and Bob are. No, I think. So let's do this. And, and Bitcoin, I always say the one thing that is, is the thing about Bitcoin is it works. And that's a good start. No, that's, that's a good start. But let's see what Libra does. And, Stable coins, yeah. I want to touch upon STOs real quick. Um, I think STOs, I think right now, we're at a stage, I don't think it's anything really any different from any security. It's just more of a electronic crypto version of a security. It is a security. That's basically it. I think we're right now in a transition from, let's say, regular mail to email. So we're in the paper form securities offerings, and now we're trying to get there. But the problem is, is that the technology is not there. You cannot go into the capital markets right now and offer to investors, hey, I'll give you an STL versus the regular traditional uh, uh, 144 offering in Asia or the, or the US and, uh, overseas. And you can't say it's more efficient. You can't say it's more cost effective. But I do see 
promise, maybe not in the near future, but maybe in the long term, where you'll see STOs where you'll have, let's say, a bond in the form of a security token, and it'll be automated, and then any of those events of defaults will be programmed in where you'll have oracles integrated where if there's a trigger of a credit rating, then it'll execute some of the, uh, uh, the acceleration events that you would happen, or voting mechanisms where it could happen, but we are not there yet. And I think eventually we will get there, but it'll just take some time. Yeah, I mean, certainly within the US, if you would have asked us me a year ago, I would have thought that security token offerings would have really blown up. But frankly, because there has been a lack in the US of platforms on which they can trade, and because of some of the restrictions that you mentioned, such as, for example, the transfer restrictions for periods of time and others, they haven't really taken off. But um, just to follow on and build on, on your point where you me mentioned bonds, you know, one of the exciting things I think is digitized securities just in general, because I'm not sure whether folks are familiar with it, but certainly in the US, it's called sometimes the Dole Foods problem. So Dole Foods, which is a public company, right, there was a litigation, we don't have to get into the facts. <laughs> and by the way, nothing is legal advice on this panel either, or investment advice. Um, but basically, it turned out that there were 33% more facially valid shares of stock, or claims to shares of stock, than actually were authorized or issued. So, you know, this is because when you, at least, you know, within the U.S., if you purchase a share of stock, your broker keeps an entry in its database, and then there's an entry in DTCC's database, right? But from the public company's perspective, Seed & Co. owns nearly all the shares all the time. So you end up with these double counting and other sorts of challenges that come up in voting and other situations. Um, so I think that kind of stuff is very promising, but as you said, it's, we're not quite there yet. So I, just on your point, because I think you asked about the innovation. So I think there'll be a lot in innovation, like tokenization of things that we don't see now. I mean, a lot of the things that people discuss with the STOs are traditional things, which are kind of covered. But I could imagine, you know, beyond imagination, you'll be able to go in that way. But I think the other thing with innovation will be, and I think Josh also mentioned it in the previous panel, a bit about how different jurisdictions, because it's not really a global uh, regulatory marketplace. So I think when you talk about innovation, you'll see different types of countries proceeding faster with different types of products. And I guess that's where you'll see a lot of innovation is where different regulatory frameworks spring up around the globe. Yeah, sorry, sorry, just to add one more comment. Um, Philip, you brought up kind of Libra. Um, what, when I think about Libra, what the pain point it's ultimately going to solve is, um, it, to a certain extent, it's going to just become sort of another version of a, a ten, Tencent WeChat Pay or Alipay. And, um, y you know, I think the way it's been masked is it looks like it's very decentralized. Facebook owns 1%, but at the end of the day, to actually operate these platforms, you're going to need to use Facebook, you're going to need to use WhatsApp, you're going to need to use Instagram. And I... I I, I don't know, I don't think it's gonna be done for fee, free, so there's a likely chance that when I start making payments on my WhatsApp to another person's Instagram account, um, it's probably gonna clip a little coupon. So at the end, I think it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, commercial, it's a commercial decision at the end of the day. And maybe, and maybe you, in, oh. we should dive into Libra, you know, you can't go, yeah. I think we should time over this conference how many minutes a panel can go before it really dives into Libra. Um, but I guess my question on that, you know, actually touches on what you raised. You know, mobile money is enormous in Asia. Are there any lessons from the compliance perspective that you know, Facebook and Libra should be taking on? What can it learn? Sure, um, so w when I look at kind of, um, you know, like digital money, I think the, the first issue Libra's gonna run into is, um, uh, you know, earlier we, we talked about, you know, banking the unbanked, but the, the reason why the, the, the unbanked today can't get a bank is, um, you know, they can't pass certain, you know, KYC and a AML con conditions as well. So I don't think that's gonna go away. And um, I, I think initially the, the thinking is to, to launch Libra is that um, there's gonna be some form of, uh, of KYC and AML still included, but I, I, I just can't see how that's gonna really work for some of these individuals that are having the same challenges today. So um, at, at the end of the day, uh, the other thing is just kind of from a regulatory perspective is um, given the size and scale of what Facebook is today, uh, for a lot of countries, I think you'll be quite hesitant because we're, we're now not talking about just social media, we're actually talking about you know uh, actual digital currency that you can transact with. So um, I think central banks, regulators are gonna be very, very sensitive and I think that's gonna be Libra's biggest challenge in terms of getting adoption across um, a, a, lot, a lot of different markets and countries that they're trying to penetrate into. So I can't speak to Asian regulations, 
but I, I can raise just a few questions with respect to Libra, and I hope it succeeds, right? I do think it is a game changer. I will say, to your point about decentralization, if you look at the 28 companies, okay, so you have Facebook and Libra, they're probably gonna vote together. If you look at Andreessen Horowitz, well, Mark Andreessen's on the board of Facebook. There's a lot of cross-pollination across those 28 companies, and you also have to imagine, what if someone votes against Facebook? What happens to them then? And when you think about a Swiss foundation, again, not a Swiss lawyer, but it needs a, a bona fide non-commercial purpose. So I suppose in this case, it's banking and banked. But when you think about the fact that the folks on this board, yes, it's one company, one vote, or one node, one vote, but these are also, in large part, for-profit organizations that have to think of their own stockholders. So how does that work? And then will this data be tracked about the banking? And then are these unbanked folks, are they part of the process of governance, or are they additional customers whose data can be sold? So I think um, there are lots of questions. Again, I hope it is successful. I'm very pro anything that brings forth this industry in a compliant way. But I just think there are a lot of questions out there. Yeah, I think it's a game changer. It's, uh, I think what, what works is on this long road where we're all here on from crypto, from being the centralized banks and central banks to the crypto future where everything is decentralized. I think Libra hits a spot now with this uh, Swiss association, which is essentially a club, because it gives that next level from the system is not a central bank owned system, and it's also not SWIFT, because SWIFT was, a, 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 it's like a club of banks, no, essentially. And so it's somebody else, it's another club, and it's sufficient amount of members, so it's not Facebook, no, it's sort of many or several. And I think so on, on, the, on that gradual scale, it does take that next step. So I kind of see it as a positive thing. And with every club, no, of course you have club members, I'm in, you're out, I'm out, you're in, but it's, it's the next step. So I think it's, we're, we're on track with Libra, yeah. yeah. So with Libra, I think um, if anybody could, you know, pull it all, I think it would be Facebook because of their uh, global presence and their interaction. Uh, I think what's going to happen is it's going to be rolled out by jurisdiction to jurisdiction. They're going to have to do a bespoke uh, legal survey of each country. Some countries are going to be more tolerant of their current model. Some countries are going to be more restrictive. So it's going to be a phase-by-phase -phase rollout of that. And I think some of the highlights of the key issues they have to think about are really these. You know, are they a payment processor? FX remittance? Uh, are they doing depository activities as a bank? You know, I think each jurisdiction is different. Um, AML sanctions, what if I send money to North Korea, who has a capital wallet, how are you gonna monitor that? And so I think it's gonna be a phase by phase and I think it is promising, but it's not gonna be in 2020, all over the world, everybody's using it's gonna take some time and uh, it's gonna be a gradual process. I guess one question I wanna actually ask each of the panelists is, given we have some regulators in the room, if there was one area of compliance that you could change, what might that be? So I, I, th I think uh, the idea of the sophisticated or the accredited investor, I think that would probably be, you know, that you give people who are willing to take on certain risks uh, the ability to have less regulation. So you really protect people who are less sophisticated. I think that would be the, the guiding principle. And then secondly, perhaps privacy being paramount would be the two principles that I would like to see in the regulation. I think, I think what happens with compliance, you're asking what is the one thing we would like to change. I think what happens in compliance is, and, and people and bankers in the room and lawyers will agree, is that the lack of common sense is one problem. So it's sort of the, the, the common sense is not, is not actually built into, into uh, current regulations. And then as a result, it actually drives people away from banks. It creates unbanked people and unbanked companies. So I think we kinda, we're kind of doing the wrong thing. You know, with, with the whole compliance uh, pressure and, and increase of, of legal density, we actually created unbanked everything and then pushed these people into the illegality, which was not, you know, that's not what, what we aim to do. So I think this is the key piece, although of, of course it's a hard piece, but I think the result is not, we didn't achieve what we came out to achieve when we, when we created this compliance and regulation. 
So I generally agree with Mark. I mean, I think in two parts. One, I think sometimes we talk about, at least in the US, de minimis exemptions for tax, right, for some smaller amounts of, of sales. You know, some of the legislators in the US have proposed things like that. I think if you can do that for tax, it would be great if you could have a de minimis amount that retail investors could buy and sell, right? If we're not worried about it for tax purposes, maybe it's not so bad. Another thing is, just, and this is more close to, I think, Mark's point, is, okay, so say you have an IEO, right, and maybe it's compliant with a lot of different jurisdictions' regulations. The moment you include it, whether the person has a lot of money or not, or is sophisticated or not, you're suddenly subject to the entire regulatory scheme. It would be great, I think, in my personal view, if one could have the opportunity to opt out in some sort of informed way. I, I, I guess for me, there isn't a, a specific point, but I think just kind of my interaction with regulators in, in Asia Pacific, I, I think it's about just making sure that regulation isn't overly stringent, but also not overly light. And so w one example I would give is um, there's a lot of discussion about um, crypto exchanges um, insuring their, their, their wallets, their cold wallets and hot wallets. Um, I'm not sure if, if people know the numbers, but to insure a hot wallet today, if you want to cover, uh, if you want a $2 million policy, um, the premium is going to cost you 750000 So, So we got to think about, well, do we want people to still in business? Because at 750000 to cover $2 million, um, a lot of people are going to leave this business really quickly. So that, that's where you're going to have kind of hindrance on kind of innovation. But um, at the same time, I am also supportive of regulation because um, a lot of us are looking at, okay, well, when is this going to become a trillion dollar asset class, $10 trillion asset class? And quite frankly, for that to happen, uh, crypto is still predominantly a very retail-based asset class. And if we want to see more traditional institutions, if you, we want to see someone like a BlackRock come in and say, I'm going to put one or two percent of my assets into cryptocurrency, um, you're going to need the infrastructure. And that infrastructure includes regulation, custody, insurance, fund administration, accounting, tax, legal. So all, all that infrastructure needs to come in together. And I think what's important is for all these different groups and parties to work together to build out that infrastructure, then we're going to see kind of more uh, traditional money come in and then it will stabilize the asset class at the end. I mean, for me, in terms of compliance, is really the privacy aspect. I do not like the idea, as you were saying, somebody knowing at 1.20 a.m., you know, where, what, what I've spent on cryptocurrency or not, it just or in just in general, it could be just 2 p.m. It doesn't really matter. If there's some sort of a way, instead of just with some of the, you know, regulators coming out with the FATF, of just telling who you are and where it's going if it exceeds certain threshold, perhaps we could have more of a way where it's pseudo-anonymous, where the transaction is going to go through, but if there's any probable cause of criminal activity, that's when the governments can actually find out who they are instead of just unilaterally telling everybody who you are to everybody in the world. And so, you know, if that's come sort of a more consideration of privacy, I think that's what I would like to see more in terms of compliance. Yeah, well, given you guys have been great at giving some advice, I've got one more question along the same lines as we wrap up. What advice, and I guess this is not legal advice, would you give to anyone you know, who's starting out a blockchain project, who's an innovator, how can they make sure that they don't get on the wrong side of compliance and you know, need to call Mark up to get him out of some trouble? What should innovators in this space pay attention for in terms of compliance? You know, I think it's a, a bit early to tell, but Korea does have a sandbox, so we started this year. And so I'm really hopeful that it will work. And hopefully that'll give more, you know, innovators to go take a little bit more risk. It's still early to tell if that's going to be really effective, but if there's more sandbox, you know, programs and more allowing for innovation, I think that's something that could be a pursuit that many uh, uh, new startup blockchain companies can try to uh, look into. So I think Nathan handed the microphone very quickly to me, like, uh, he was very keen. So I, I think it's a very difficult question. It sounds easy, but it's very, very complex. Because I think one of the complexities is you said people are just starting out, and people starting out don't have the access to that bespoke legal advice, and they don't have the relationship with the regulators. So I would just guess, and I'm sure other people are better qualified to have a guess, I'd say the first thing is look at what you're doing. Secondly, um, are you taking money from people? So that's the, uh, are you fundraising? Like in China, that would be one of the first things is don't try to fundraise raise in China. 
Secondly is try to avoid any American touch point would be the second point. And I think they would be the major things to look at. So two things I would say. One is from the beginning, think about privacy concerns, think about GDPR and other sorts of concerns at the architecture phase when you're just thinking about how to design you know, your blockchain-based project because that will be hard to change potentially. You need to figure out what information is going to go on-chain versus off-chain. Um, another thing, and this is maybe a little bit later down the line, not quite the beginning, but um, if you're going to sell something in the U.S. with legal counsel, many of the regulators in the U.S. have been inviting folks at early stages in their projects to come speak with them to talk and help them understand it and to see whether there may be some ability to kind of architect uh, compliance. Uh, so I think, again, don't, don't rush into the U.S. unless um, you have legal counsel. Are they, are they well, I mean, that's an excellent question. Of course, being government the regulator, question? there's... Hmm? Do you mind repeating the question? Just oh, sure. The question was, do they have enough resources? So I can't speak for all of the, the regulators. I do know at, at the SEC, um, FinHub, they have been continually inviting people in. They do have dedicated staff from all different divisions, and they've actually been doing road shows throughout the U.S. to actually go and meet people in their markets. Again, I'm sure they would love to have more, but I, I have to say, I don't know how many projects are rushing in to go see them. I, I think um, I, I'm, not, I'm not from a legal background, so I think me giving advice, it's, it's worth around one cent, but um, I, I I think I just do kind of like a sniff test, like what, whatever you're doing, like I believe in the innovation and the technology side that, you know, there's a lot of bright minds out there, but um, look back at maybe the more traditional side and say, you know, how are things done and ensure that you, you do have some level of governance. Um, one of the most scary things that I saw, you know, around two years ago in the, in the ICO market was the amount of people that actually had fundraised and they actually, um, when they raised, you know, Bitcoin or Ether, they actually transferred that into their personal account. Um, and and it, it was shocking because a lot of people thought it was okay, and I was like, hey, that's that's embezzlement. You can go to jail for that. And so I, I, I think, you know, decentralization is good, but what it has also led to is it's led to kind of uh, a lack of governance, and I think in order for anything to work at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be centralized, but I think it does require to have governance. So I think governance is maybe the thing I would uh, tell everyone to kind of take away when you're thinking about your business. <clears throat> now that I'm no longer a partner at a law firm, I find it easier to say that, and that's probably going to be water on your mails. But you should go get a lawyer. Like, you do need a lawyer if you do start off in, in, in crypto. <clears throat> and, and I think the one thing that you should tell your lawyer is that you should try to stay out of jail. That in crypto, you're always a bit on the gray side. That's filled in, no? But you should stay out of jail, yeah. And if you can't sleep anymore being a founder, not because of HR problems or funding problems, but because you think, that you're actually getting closer to that stay out of jail problem, <laughs> then you should probably call your lawyer. Great. Well, thank you for a fantastic panel that's gone from you know the high complexities of compliance right down to some practical advice of stay out of jail. Thank you very much. <laughs> Once again, thank you very much, Philip, our moderator for this panel discussion and a distinguished speakers. Thank you again.